Wow. There it is. Good morning, Meridian High School. I'm going to put my cell phone away. All right, good morning, Meridian High School. Uh, my name is Jared Pete. I'm a history teacher here, and I'm joined today by Mr. Alfred Zernick. Um, I want to begin, though, with a couple of quick thank yous before we get into our program. I want to thank Ms. Sample, Mr. Tim Payne from FCC TV, and our administration, uh, Ms. Hardy, Mr. Serensis, Mr. Laub, and Ms. McDuff for their assistance and support. And then finally, Mr. Zernick's daughter, Dr. Zernick, one of our own teachers who helped to make today happen. Um, Mr. Zernick, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a conversation up here on the stage. Mr. Zernick and I have talked multiple times for over an hour and a half ahead of this event to prepare. So I feel like I know your story pretty well. We've got a good rapport going. Um, and I, embedded in my questions are also questions that students from Meridian High School have submitted ahead of time. Please also know that once our presentation today concludes, you'll have an opportunity to stick around and talk with uh, Mr. Zernick. So for our students who are watching on the live stream, come on down to the auditorium during Mustang block time, and you can ask uh, Mr. Zernick some questions. And for our students in the audience, please stick around to talk with Mr. Zernick some more. Okay? So Mr. Zernick, you're 90 years old. You live in Philadelphia. You drove three hours to be here. And to my knowledge, this is your first time publicly speaking about your experiences. What made you want to come and speak to our community today? Well, I think that these young people should know what history is and was. And man's humanity against man should not be repeated. And the Germans have an expression, ni vida, ni vida. Never again. The French have adopted that jamais plus. For those of you who are studying French, jamais plus means again, never again. And um, Latin, homo, homoni, lupus, means humanity to man. And that is why I wanted to come and chat with you. You are young. You are America's pride and joy. You are the future leaders. And you will lead this country in some capacity, one way or another. And you will remember that I came to speak to you. Thank you. So I want to start with your life story, and I want to start with your family. You were born on August 2nd, 1932, in Berlin, Germany. Tell us about your family and the world that you were born into. <clears throat> well, let me tell you about my grandfather. Hugo Zernick was a citizen of a city in East Prussia called Radibor, which is now Polish. How it became Polish is something that you will study in your history. And he had a liquor distillery. And he had <clears throat> three sons. My mother's father, Alfred Dallas, was the president of the Berlin Brokers Association and was a highly respected banker. <clears throat> and like so many German Jews, was a great German patriot. My 
grandfather, Hugo Zernick, had three sons. My father, Kurt, my uncle, George, and my uncle, Carl. When the First World War broke out, my father, who had finished his one year of service in the German army and was a registered pharmacist, was called up for duty, and he served on the Russian and the French front. While he was in the French front, he was the chief medic of an infantry battalion, and the medics, as in many cases, were killed helping the wounded. He was not. And he was wounded, and in spite of that, he stayed and took care of the wounded of the battalion. For that, he was awarded <clears throat> the Iron Cross for bravery, and he was given the equivalent of a German Purple Heart called Verwundungsmedaille, Wounded Medal. My uncle George served on the Russian front. He was an officer in an infantry platoon, and served loyally. My youngest uncle, Carl, was a law student. And he gave up law, and he went from one regiment to another because in those days, you didn't, there wasn't a draft. You volunteered for battalions and regiments. He was slightly underweight, and he went, and he was accepted by the 26th Infantry Regiment. He was He was in action after basic training for six weeks when he was killed. How he was killed, I don't know. And he's buried in a common grave in northern France. His mother, my grandmother, And I'm telling you this because there'll be a follow-up since I know some of the questions. <laughs> His mother was taken to a place called Theresien. The German word is Theresienstadt. This was a special concentration camp for older people. Now that unto itself sounds very, very nice, that they were considerate of older people, but it wasn't, because Theresen was a way station to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, they had two things. They had the gas chambers, and they had the crematorium. She was spared this because she died. What she died of, she was in her 70s, and I guess she died of old age. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to ignore you, but 
I'm trying to talk to everybody. So my mother and father married in 32, and I was born in 33. No, I was born in 32. <laughs> they married in 31. Uh, they had a fantastic life. My father was partner in a drugstore called the Adla Apotheke, the Eagle Pharmacy, which was the second largest drugstore in Berlin. Berlin was a metropolis. Restaurants, operas, theater, art museums. To a certain extent, Berlin still is. It's a very, very civilized place, although there are scars from the war. And they had a wonderful life. The theater, music, my father had a successful life. Mr. Zernick. Um, yes. Um, jump back in here. So one of the things that it really became clear to me in talking with you is your, your family came from a, a distinguished German Jewish family. They had served honorably in World War I. They were established business people, well to do within the Berlin community. And then the Nazis come. And so you were, you were less than one when the Nazis came to power in 1933 in Germany. And so I know you don't remember a lot of this, but I know your parents talked about it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the changes that happened once the Nazis came to power for German well, Jews? Well, the first thing you have to remember, and I don't know the name of the legislation, but in the spring of 33. Now, Hitler came to power January 30th, 1933. In the spring of 33, there was legislation. All Jewish employees of state organizations were fired. There was, whoever you were, you were a doctor, you were a lawyer, you were an administrator, et cetera, et cetera, you lost your job. At that point, and now I'm going back, at that point, my mother, who was very, very worldly-minded. In high school, she studied French and English. Said to my father, we have to get out of here. Wir müssen hier raus. We have to get out. Wir müssen hier raus. And he said, when it comes time, to leave Germany, I will make the decision. Ich entscheide, wenn wir Deutschland verlassen. And she talked about it, and he said, Ich bin Frontkämpfer. I'm a combat veteran. I have an Iron Cross. I was wounded. They'll never touch me. And so German history goes on and on and on, which you will teach them. 1935, which you will teach them also, they revoked Jewish citizenship. Anyone who is a Jew lost German citizenship And still, my father would not leave. He had the Iron Cross. 
Yeah, and the wounded metal. Finally, in 38, they came for him. And there is a concentration camp north of Berlin. They sent him there. And he got frostbite in his hands and his legs. My mother, who was rather sophisticated for her age, bribed the Gestapo. You wouldn't think that the Germans, as rigid as they are, would let somebody bribe the Gestapo. Gestapo, the word Gestapo, Geheimne Staatspolizei, secret state police. But she bribed them and they let my father go with the understanding they leave Germany. Now, where did they go? Can I stop you then? Before stop. It, this is a good part of the story, but I don't want to miss over your experiences, because when we first talked, one of the first things you told me about was your experience on Kristallnacht. And I want to make sure that, that we, we talk you, about it. Thank you, thank you, That's why I'm here. That's why they pay me the big bucks. Um, so, Kristallnacht. So just for, for context for our students, um, I'm going to take you back to November 10th, 1938, because on November 9th, an event called Kristallnacht took place. It's a state-organized mob attack, or what's called a pogrom, that it targeted Jewish homes, businesses, and synagogues. It's called Kristallnacht because it's a night of broken glass, and as you can see from the image up here on the screen, there was a lot of broken glass. Um, it took place in hundreds of cities across the German Reich and resulted in the death of over 100 Jews. It's considered a decisive turning point in the move towards state-sponsored violence against the Jews in Germany. And this event had a really profound impact on your life. I want you to make sure that you tell us that story. I, <clears throat> on January 10th, I came to class, and in, in Berlin, which had first class public schools, it was not necessary to go to private school. And I walked in, and I sat down, and like all of you, I had a knapsack. I loosened the sap, sat it down. And Mr. Stetiker came in and said, Alfred, du hast Ferien. Alfred, you have vacations. So I said, but I, I like school. Nein, nein, du hast Ferien. So I took my knapsack. This was 1938, you have to understand. I said, Heil Hitler, and I left the classroom. And the thing that I, as a six-year-old, remember, when I told my parents what had happened, they looked at each other. And I will never, never, never forget that look. Sure. And that was the end of my public school education. I, I went to a Jewish private school until we left Berlin in 38 after my mother got done bribing the Gestapo. So my understanding is you, you, your family left Germany in August of 1939. Is that That's right? All right. So just so we know, World War II begins September 1st, 1939. So if we're talking about timing, and timing is everything, Great timing. Your family got out at literally the last possible moment. Um, tell us about that Germany, uh, that journey from Germany to France. We crossed 
we left Germany, and my mother secreted a 40 or 50 pound British note, which was worth a lot of money, in her brassiere. And we got to Italy, across the Brenner Pass. And there we arranged to be smuggled into France. Now the French Coast Guard was doing the smuggling. And they had long boats. And they smuggled people into the south of France. And the French Coast Guard, in order to make this thing look pretty kosher, OK, would machine gun alternate boats. We were fortunate that our boat was not machine gunned. And we landed in the south of France. And we landed near the city of Marseille, which was a major seaport in the south of France. It's also the at that time, and I don't know how things are today, the filthiest city in France. I had every childhood sickness you can imagine. These were the days before penicillin and sulfur drugs. And the French military grabbed my father because he had been a veteran of the First World War in the German army, and they sent him to a camp called Fort Les Mille. For those of you who are interested in reading about Les Mille, there is a book by Lion Feuchtwanger, and the book is in English, if you want to read it, as to what the situation was in Les Mille. Now, where do we stand? We're, we're good. And so right behind you, I have some pictures from, from Camp Les Mille, uh, because your father wasn't the only distinguished resident of that camp. Um, there were many famous German Jews who were interned there, including the artist Marc Chagall, Hannah Arendt, um, as well as um, Lion Fuchtwanger. Lion Feuchtwanger. Feuchtwanger. Thank a you. great name in German literature. That's right. Very, very famous. Um, your family, your father is interned in France. Meanwhile, you're working to get out of France. Your family is working to make it out of France and make it to America. Tell us a little bit about how you were able to, well, to get on one as, of the last boats to America. As I told you, my mother did not go to the gymnasium. My father did and studied Latin and Greek. My mother went to what is known in Germany as the Realschule. That was the high school for everybody who was not going to go to the university. It was highly disciplined, and she chose to study English and French, which for the first time she put to good use mm -hmm. in France. And she also put her English to good use because the American consul was very, very sympathetic to the plight of the refugees. Contrary, contrary to the attitude of the American State Department, which was viciously anti-Semitic. Now, you say, but how can that be in the Roosevelt era? Well, it happens. The head of the State Department, and I will leave that up to you when you have your classes, 
was known as he didn't want more Jews in America. That's right. So I'm going to make a little sidebar comment as a history teacher here. So I did some research after uh, speaking with Mr. Zernick, um, and it, it's most likely that the consul who got your family out of France was this gentleman up here on the screen, Mr. Hiram Bingham IV, he went by Harry. Um, and he wasn't well known at the time, um, but he was a U.S. State Department official who actually went against State Department policy. And in doing my research in 2002, then Secretary of State Colin Powell issued him a, and this is a great name, a Constructive Dissent Award, posthumously, um, which I think is sort of interesting. Also a fun fact, his father, Hiram Bingham III, is credited with rediscovering Machu Picchu. So it comes from quite a distinguished, distinguished family. Um, your family makes it out on one of the last boats from France to, to America. Tell us about that experience. What was it like to, well, I, I'm actually going to ask you a question here from one of our students. Her name is Sophia. She's a 12th grader, and she wanted to know, what was it like when you first came to the U.S.? What stood out to you most about American culture? How did you deal with leaving behind? Well, I should tell you first, we took the last boat out of France. The liner, <clears throat> the liner Champlain, and we arrived here on the return trip. The crew of the Champlain scuttled her so she would not fall into German hands. At that time, when we came, May 28, 1940, was also a historical date in European history because at that point, the British began to take off the British Expeditionary Force. And this is, unto itself is a history you may want to read. They got all the British citizens on the east coast of England to send their small boats to the coast of Dunkirk. This is the famous, famous evacuation of Dunkirk. And there are several history books on this. It's a good term paper for you to read. That was the same date we arrived here. Now, I must say, all this time, I never had any fear because I was too young to appreciate the terror, the fear that we had. But my mother, with her command of French, English, and knowing what the Nazis were was the one who had concerns. So if you guys can't tell, Mr. Zernick is a great linguist. Um, and one of the things that struck me in talking to you about your experiences when you came to the US as a young person um, was how you use language to advance yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about how you use language and learn different languages all right, I continued my study of French in high school because in those days, the language in the world was French. Now it is English, and in some parts it's Spanish. So I went, I should also tell you, and I will take this as a sideline, I finished the Philadelphia public school system, which is a 12-year program from first grade through 12th grade. I finished in 10 years by skipping and going to summer school. 
I was fortunate in first grade to have a teacher who had studied French in high school and in college, in addition to her pedagogical courses. And so I spoke French to her, and she spoke English to me, and, within, and she handed me a book, a second grade reader. She said, here, read it. And in second grade, six months later, she said to me, you're promoted. And that was the beginning. And all my friends were Americans. I never spoke German. I spoke English outside my front door, and I spoke German inside my front door. And that is how I ra was raised bilingually, which I am now totally fluent in. I had to go to college to learn the German grammar, which let me tell you, if any of you are <laughs> planning to study German, you'd better know declensions. The declensions in German are four declensions, nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. But if you study Latin, if I'm not mistaken, it's seven declensions. You're asking the wrong person, unfortunately. You're, Okay. Whoever <laughs> studies Latin, it's, it's murder, okay? <laughs> what is that? They conjugate in the passive voice. June, oh, you my God. It, Latin is not an easy language. Can I Latin I learned <laughs> as homo, homoni lupus, man's, humanity to man. I learn from citations by my father. Okay. I, want, I want to ask you another question about your experience early on in the US. And I think you can talk about your military experience here, too. So one of the, one of the most common questions or themes we got from students was asking about experience with anti-Semitism. And I had asked you when we were talking before about Growing up in America in the 1940s and 50s, your experiences with anti-Semitism. And your answer actually genuinely surprised me when we talked about this. And I think it would be of interest um, for our students and staff. Uh, so tell us about your experiences in the 40s and 50s, um, how you embraced America, and also your experiences with, with anti-Semitism in the 40s and 50s. Let me tell you something about anti-Semitism. <laughs> in Germany, if you were a Jew, they would call you a dirty Jew to your face. In America, they don't do that. Anti-Semitism, anti it's much more sophisticated. You just don't get promoted. You get quiet remarks. It's is again, I repeat, it's sophisticated, the anti-Semitism. It's not open. They don't have the guts. I was never called a dirty Jew. See, now for instance, in Germany, there was a very, very famous German aristocrat politician whose father founded General Electric in Germany. His name was Walter Rathenau. And quite openly, people will say, schlagt ihn tot in Rathenau, die gottverdammte Judensau. Kill him dead, this Rathenau, the goddamn Jew. Pig, okay? Zau is the German word for pig. It wasn't like that in America. 
The anti-Semitism, it's much more sophisticated. So for example, you told me when you were applying for jobs, like in the banking industry, well, there are certain places you knew. I majored in finance in college. And I took enough accounting that I could make a living. But I knew one thing, never, never, never apply for a position in a bank. Because somehow or other they would find out that you're Jewish and you would get turned down. Now this was, I graduated in 54. And let me tell you something. You knew right away. Now, if you wanted a job selling life insurance, plenty of jobs. If you wanted a job uh, selling mortgages, plenty of jobs. If you wanted a job in the real estate field, but not in the investment portion, portion of it. That was fine. There were jobs, but there was a restriction. Right. And you knew what this restriction is. So, and you just, you just said, well, this is why, this is why in the 40s and the 50s, you had, even though there was discrimination in medicine and dentistry, this is why there were so many Jews in the medical field, in the dental field, in the veterinary field, and things of that nature. They knew where they were not wanted. And they played the game. Now, when I started, if I may, the military. Please. When I started Temple University in September of 50, I had just finished my 10 years of school in the Philadelphia public school system. I went right in. I didn't bother with the University of Pennsylvania, which is also in Philadelphia, which is a very fine school. I didn't bother because in those days, the tuition at the University of Pennsylvania, even though Wharton School was a plum to be desired, I went straight to Temple University where the tuition was $450 a year. I had accumulated in the 10 years that I was in America, close to $1,000. So I didn't need a scholarship. I didn't go and ask for anything. I said, here's your money. I then went to the bookstore and got the books for $25, and that was it. And I was standing in line for some other course, and I said to one of the students, I said, what's that? They said, that's ROTC. I said, what is ROTC? And he explained to me, Reserve Officers Training Corps. I said, well, what's the deal? He said, the deal is that when you are finished, you are a second lieutenant in the United States Army. And I said, I owe this country something, and I want to serve. So I joined ROTC. And at the end of four years, I was commissioned a second lieutenant. Now, I was trained as a transportation officer. However, there was a surplus of transportation officers and so I was given a choice of anything that I wanted. And I was, at that time, quite upset because I spent a lot of time. 
I spent a week at the amphibious warfare school. I spent time at Fort Eustis, Virginia. I said, well, I'm going to put my knowledge of finance to use. So I took finance. And I did that for two years. And at that time, I volunteered for duty in Germany because they knew, I knew they needed German-speaking officers. And for those of you, oh, all of you know English, when I speak German, you do not know that I'm an American. I speak it fluently. And I volunteered for Germany and they sent me to a place called Indian Town Gap, which is right outside of Harrisburg. And it was a very disappointing experience, even to the extent that every weekend I was free and I went to Temple University because one of the Department of Army civilians went to Philadelphia for her family and I took a drive with her. And I finished two courses in accounting. And afterwards, I had an eight-year obligation in the inactive reserve. But instead, I stayed in the active reserve and eventually the army, and I won't go into this, they decided to close out the unit I was serving in. And I was left the service with the rank of major. I had done my duty to my country, and I'm very satisfied to have done that. And thank you for your service. And I expect everybody else to do that the same thing. But today, people don't go into the service. And I think two years in the Army, meeting people from other religions, other races, other ethnic backgrounds, I think is the great equalizer. We're always talking about equalizing this civilization. That's the greatest. You meet people who don't speak proper English. You meet people who barely got past the eighth grade, and you learn to deal with it. This is, li this is being a liberal. <laughs> So uh, you, you told me not to talk politics, so I'm going no, to push politics. us ahead. <laughs> we're going to push ahead. Um, so you mentioned you, you wanted to go to Germany. They sent you to outside of Harrisburg. But you did eventually go back to Germany in the 1980s. And I think when we, when we talked about, about that return visit, I was thinking about it in terms of my family, and that my grandmother, who was born in the, in the United States, but who had family that died in the Holocaust, when she went to Germany for the first time, there's a lot of trepidation that she had about her feelings, her emotions. I want you to tell us about your trip back, because you had a very, I think, different experience. Um, well, tell us about how you went back to Germany. What was that whole experience like? The city of Berlin, which is, I think, very avant-garde, sponsored former residents to come back. And I applied several times, and they said, you're too young, you're too young, you're too young. But eventually, they called me, and, they, and I went there. But you have to understand, I walk around with a chip on my shoulder. I'm an American. I'm proud to be an American. If you don't like it, go pound sand. I, 
I went back to Germany. I spoke German constantly. First of all, you can't tell I'm an American when I speak German. I speak classic Berliner High German. And nobody gave me a hard time. I had no problems. Well, can I ask you, this is a little off script here, but as yes. you're walking around, you're seeing people who are your generation, older generations, who are alive, lived through what the Nazis did. Did you think anything when you no. saw them? No. no. I didn't know who was a Nazi and who was not. To this day, you don't know. Now, none of the older people will admit to me that they were members of the Hitler Youth, Hitler Jugend, or Big M, Bund Deutscher Mädchen, Organization of Young Girls, okay? I don't look at it that way. Now, we, where we live, down the street, there is a woman whose husband is an anesthesiologist. And Judy, my wife, invited her and her husband for a party. He did not come. And I had my suspicions about it. You know, nobody has to say, you're Jewish and I want nothing to do. But there are those people who just, you can just feel it, okay? okay. And so I just ignored him. I don't know where he is today because I haven't seen him around. I think they got divorced, but that, I don't know. That happened. And I really don't care. <laughs> That's fair. All right, so we are, we are running up on time. So I want to wrap up with one last question. And Shoot. Then we'll, and then we'll uh, turn the lights on and people can come talk to you. So tomorrow is Yom HaShoah, which is Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, you know, in the next 10 to 15 years, there's not going to be any Holocaust survivors left. Um, in Judaism, when someone dies, we say, excuse me, um, their memory, may their memory be a blessing. Um, and I'm hoping that the memory from today is that. Well, you have a film. Well, you're, we do. You're we do. recording. Well, yeah, you can do the this. live experience is something as well. Um, so as we conclude, what, what hopes do you have for what students will take away from this to pass on to future generations? Well, as I told you at the beginning, Jamais plus, ni vida, never again. Now, am I wild? I have to go into politics. <laughs> Having been in the medical business, which we haven't discussed, All these people coming across the border, they haven't been vaccinated for polio. They haven't been vaccinated against measles. The women have not been vaccinated for the German measles vaccine, which if they are pregnant and they get German measles vaccine, they should have been vaccinated for rubella, which all of these young people here were vaccinated at birth. It's called rubella. And it will just ruin a fetus in the mother's womb. These people are all coming across. What kind of an epidemic are we going to have in this country You've got now seven million people having crossed the border. Okay. There's well, going to be a problem. 
And the problem is also going to be in the school because these students will come into the school and you're going to have to be sure uh, they're all vaccinated. <laughs> we'll work on that. All right, thank you, Mr. Zernick. Let's give a round of applause, please. So Mr. Zernick's gonna stick around during, during stable group or Mustang block, so feel free to come down and ask him questions, but that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you.